Inside the third episode of Outsourcing Life, I've invited the CEO of a large outsourcing company with over 1,500 employees from the Philippines. I asked him to share how his company helps businesses from around the world achieve their goals through offshore hiring. Also, towards the end of the podcast, we will reveal to you a contest that we will be announcing shortly to help you fund a virtual assistant in the Philippines. So let's get to it. Welcome to the Outsourcing Live Podcast, where you will learn to build a virtual team to run your business. And now, your host, Tyrone Shum. Hi everyone, it's Tyrone Shum from Outsourcing Live, and we've got another special podcast here today. I've got a special guest right now from the Philippines, and he he runs and manages a really large outsourcing company with over a thousand staff uh, currently there. And the reason why I got him onto a call today is because I wanted to share from his experience or interview him and find out what it's like to have an outsourcing company and to work with clients and potentially if you are interested in uh, getting services like through an outsourcing company in the Philippines, then this would be a company to speak to and also speak to the person who actually runs it. So let me introduce you to Philip Kaiman. So welcome to the call. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Well, it's a, it's really exciting to have you here, and I'm pretty sure all the listeners and the viewers want to find out a little bit more about you. Uh, firstly, I might just introduce you know, the name of your company. The name of your company, I know, is called Micro Microsourcing. So maybe just give a little background how you came across that name, how you created that business, and uh, yeah, what's it all about as well, and what do you do for people? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm half Dutch, half Filipino, so I grew up here in um, in Holland, but I was born in the Philippines. Ah. Um, and so what happened is that I studied in Holland, and I started a company there called Max Lifestyle. And Max Lifestyle is a network of uh, online publications. And being from the Philippines, I knew that I could probably do the content development and the web design a lot cheaper here uh, than instead of doing it in Holland. So seven years ago, I came to the Philippines and I started a company specifically for that purpose. So I didn't know that I could actually outsource it to a third party. I thought the only way for me to operate in the Philippines is to actually come here and incorporate and set up my own business. Um, so it started very small. We just had a few people doing uh, content writing and some graphic design work. And then what happened after is that our clients and our partners started noticing that we were doing fantastic work from the Philippines with a very, very low cost. So that's why they started asking us, could you also do the same for us and set, up a, set us up with a team here in the Philippines? Um, still from within microsourcing or from within our company, but they actually really work dedicated uh, for those companies. Okay. So that's how that kind of came to being. So it started off as like an in-house captive uh, for Max Lifestyle. And then as we started doing more and more work for third parties, uh, we spun it off and called it microsourcing and started operating it as an uh, outsourcing solutions provider. That's a great That's a great way. It's interesting how you started off with Max Lifestyle first. What was Max Lifestyle all about anyway? Like you mentioned content writing and web development. What exactly was that business all about when it first started? Um, it's still live actually now. You can visit the website at maxlifestyle.net. It's a, it's a network of websites that deal with different lifestyle subjects like snowboarding, skiing, uh, yoga, meditation, those kind of things. And uh, although it's a Dutch company, since I'm half Dutch, uh, all the content was written for an uh, English based audience, mostly for the US and Canada and Australia, etc. Um, so we needed to write all the content in English, and that's actually why we fought about the Philippines, because the English language skills are so, uh, so good here. Gotcha, alright, that's a very interesting. So it's an interesting spin off, and as you said, that company still exists. So when that company first started, you obviously had content to write to produce all that content, put it onto the internet, and you had to find web developers and graphic designers to be able to put all those websites together. So from there onwards, you said it spun into microsourcing as well too, which became an outsourcing solution company. Where did you end up getting more of your clients from? Because obviously one of them was your max lifestyle, but how did you manage to find other clients as well? Um, now, we're a web development company, so of course we're very good at online marketing. So when we created Microsourcing as a separate company, we also created Microsourcing.com and we made it into a highly effective website. Uh, we did online marketing really well. Um, so through those channels, we started getting inquiries. 
Um, and that's how we grew the business quite fast, actually. So if, if you actually think about it, we started with only three people in 2004, uh, and now we're well over 1,500. Wow, that is extremely fast, and obviously yeah. you know, you've got you've managed to capture a nice, solid part of the market from, I, get, I assume, overseas. Are there many companies locally that even ask you to help help them do any work, or is it mostly overseas people? Uh, it's one hundred percent overseas. Let's say we are we are operating here on our special incentive program from the Philippine government. Uh, but one of the rules to get those incentives is that you have to be a one hundred percent export company. So all our clients they're all based abroad, uh, mostly from the English language world. So the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, those kind of countries. Oh, that's very interesting. And you mentioned that microsourcing is mainly focused on uh, web development or was focused on that. Are there other services that you do offer as well within microsourcing? Uh, well, we started off from, from that because that was the thing that actually brought us here to the Philippines. But if you look at microsourcing, it's not so much about um, specializing in certain disciplines. Let's say we are not a call center, we are not a web development firm, we're not a software development firm. Uh, what we mostly do is enable foreign companies to operate here in the Philippines. And we do that through a number of delivery models. Um, but, but the thing is that we, our clients, they all have the need to operate more cost effectively and more flexibly. Mm. Um, and then they use us to establish an operation here in the Philippines. If, if you look at, let's say, myself, let's say, I came here because I wanted to have people from the Philippines working for my company. But at that time, I thought the only way to do that was to actually go here and incorporate. If I had known about companies like microsourcing, through which I could get my own staff and set up my own operation, without having to incorporate, I would probably have done that and I would never have started microsourcing, to be honest. Yeah, that was back then, uh, back in 2004, I assumed there weren't many companies out there that did that until now, obviously. No, no, exactly. But so, so if you look at the people we entertain, they're mostly people like how I was uh, seven years ago, small, medium-sized business owners. Mm. Uh, who have the need to, to, cut, uh, to cut costs and operate more flexibly. Um, so they would like to operate from the Philippines, and then we offer them easy ways of doing that without having to go through all the hassles of actually going here and incorporating. Which is really, really good, and that's a, a sort of a one-stop solution, which is great because a lot of small companies to medium-sized companies, particularly in Australia, in the States, they're all looking to get a reduced, I guess, lower-cost solution because the fact is if you're to hire someone locally, say in the States, it costs you anywhere in the vicinity of $15, $20 per hour just to be able to get, yeah. say, like a, a administration staff. And we know that in the Philippines, you could get it at a fraction of that cost and also even have all the infrastructure set up. So what I'm actually curious about is, say, for example, I'm a, a, a business, a small business coming over to, say, Philippines and I'm interested in hiring someone like an administration staff, what's the process that's involved in order to be able to hire somebody like that, say going yeah. through microsourcing? Now, so what the main delivery model we use here for small, medium-sized businesses is called offshore staff leasing. And the way that works is actually it's very similar to how you would hire staff locally. Let's say you tell us the kind of person you're looking for, so you provide a job description and you explain a little bit about what the person will be doing, what kind of requirements that the job might have. And then we will start looking for people here in the Philippines who are suitable to do that job. Um, then we will first screen them ourselves, up to the point where we feel that, yes, indeed, these people will be able to do that. And then we would endorse them to you, and then you can screen them in the same way you would do locally. So if you want them to take written tests or submit sample work, or if you want to interview them through the webcam or, or even here on location, then we will facilitate all of that, and then in the end, you are the one who says, well, I would like to have this, this, and this person work for me from the Philippines. Um, so, so that's how staff leasing works. Let's say you tell us who you're looking for, we'll hire them, and then we will put them in our offices, and we will manage them and take care of them. Um, but in many ways, although legally they are our, our employees, uh, operationally they are actually yours, because you, you selected them, and they're working for you full-time and exclusively. Okay, that's a really smart solution because at the end of the day, you don't have to worry about chasing up staff, ensuring that they're going to come to work on time, ensuring that they they get their pal. Because I know that one thing that I found with working with yeah. virtual staff is that there's always brownouts, and having them in an office where you've probably got backup generators and so forth, you've got consistent 24/7 power, 
consistently going through. Yeah, obviously. exactly. <laughs> Oh, plus, plus, we also get uh, involved in operational um, uh, performance. So, let's say we'll provide all our clients are, are provided with their own operations supervisor. So that's someone who actually knows your business, and knows the metrics, and then what kind of performance you're looking for, and then they'll do whatever they can to make sure that performance targets are met and exceeded. So uh, you really have someone to say on the ground here in the Philippines who's taking care of your interests. Which is really good, sort of like a project manager in in many ways. Yeah. I guess that. You're really paying for not just only for your virtual staff, like your virtual assistant or your administration staff, but you're also getting bundled in that with a project manager, yeah. which is really really. No, important. exactly. That's no, I'm going to say, going to say, so it's not it's not pure staff leasing. It's not like we're only providing manpower and then good luck to you. I hope it works out. We already get involved with the day to day, and we 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 take responsibility in making sure that uh, that your that operational uh, targets are actually met. Which is really, really important because I think at yep. the end of the day, you don't want to be spending your time trying to figure out what needs to be done next and uh, chasing up on someone who, who might not be competent with the work. No, exactly. Absolutely. But it's, it's a very flexible system, actually. If you look at it, we also have clients who have much larger organizations. Maybe they have 30, 40, 50 people. In fact, our largest client uh, has more than 800 people. Um, in those kind of cases, they might really have their own uh, management staff. So they, it's almost like they have set up their own company within microsourcing. So, um, and then they also they can also even operate from their own offices. So for some larger clients, we we provide them with their own dedicated offices, for instance. Which is not not in the microsourcing building, or is it outside of the microsourcing building? You're saying. Um, now let's say we have multiple buildings. We have multiple locations from which we work from. Yeah. Uh, if it's a small, if it's a small setup, we might provide them just within an office from within our existing buildings. Uh, but we can also set up a whole, uh, whole dedicated floor for one client, for instance. Uh, we're currently doing that for two clients. We're providing them with their own floors in in, a, in an office building. Is it common for their their staff, like say for example their managers, to come over from say the states or wherever they're from, these companies, to spend a bit of time? Uh, training their staff and also spending their time managing their staff from here, or is it mostly done remotely? How does it work that way? Um, both. Let's say we, we always encourage clients to come over uh, for, for a number of reasons. Let's say it's always a good thing for their staff here in the Philippines, of course, to meet them in person and establish a bit of a bond, um, mm -hmm. which works really well. Um, and of course, I'll just operationally, let's say it's always good to have an actual face to face meeting with your clients every now and then. And if we cannot go there to meet with them, then it's always nice, of course, that they visit us and meet with us, with us here. It's really, really good. It, I'm actually curious to, to ask you as well is what what are some of your typical clients that you do take on? Uh, it, it varies very greatly. Let's say uh, if you look at our delivery models, we have some that are very suitable to small, medium-sized businesses, and mm -hmm. we have some that are suitable for very large companies. Um, so if you look at our clients, we have... The smallest ones might just be individual entrepreneurs, uh, small business owners, people who just started up a business and they might have one virtual assistant working for them from the Philippines. Uh, on the other side, we also have large multinationals. We have hundreds of people uh, working from pretty much their own mini company from within microsourcing. <laughs> so it's a very varied thing and also the industries can vary greatly. Let's say we have a large concentration of clients who are in, in the IT and internet industry. Uh, we have a lot of clients who have, um, let's say, repetitive IT production processes. Uh, let's say that revolve around maybe data processing or data cleansing. Um, we also have clients who need to do call work, so they have either inbound or outbound calls. Um, a lot of creative work as well. Uh, the Philippines has a lot of very good graphic design skills, uh, flash designers, animators, that kind of work. Yeah, it's, it's really so so it's it's a really great variation. And what we always just tell clients. Um, you would like to do something in the Philippines, tell us what it is, then we'll see and we'll evaluate if the talent is here to do that successfully. And if it is, then we can actually entertain that and we'll make sure to manage it well uh, and make sure it runs smoothly. But if you look at what the Filipino people are best in, it's uh, definitely English language skills because the, the whole country is basically English language speaking. Mm -hmm. um, they are very um, westernized, let's say they have a large affinity with Western culture. Um, they're very creative in nature. Um, and there's just a large availability of higher educated people. So if you're looking at highly technical skills or, or lawyers, uh, doctors, those kind of people, uh, they're readily available here. And of course, their salary expectations are a lot lower than in most Western countries. That's very interesting. You mentioned lawyers, doctors, those kind of people. 
how would you how would you be able to hire somebody like that? And obviously, a doctor might be a little bit more difficult unless they're seeing a patient to patient. But maybe if they're writing a doctrine or or, or thesis or something like that, they may be at a system. Yeah, yeah. But like lawyers, for example, um, what other very highly professional, maybe business, maybe project managers, like very high executive project managers. Yeah. Those. Those. Yeah, are also, I'd say in most in most back office functions, let's say if you look at um, yeah, it's it's. Finance and accounting, for instance, it, it's very easy to find very highly qualified accountants here, for instance, mm. uh, to do your bookkeeping and your auditing and that kind of stuff. Uh, on the HR side as well, let's say offshore recruitment, let's say meaning that you have someone here running, screening your resumes and doing the calls with applicants. That's also a very big process that's happening here. Um, and then legal process outsourcing, that, that all revolves around having Filipino lawyers doing your, your case study research, for instance. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's like you almost, if, if you were. If you didn't know that these people were in the Philippines, you'd obviously yeah. think that they're literally living in the same country as you. It's the skill sets no, are exactly. almost the sa are pretty much the yeah. same. I think the training comes because I've worked with VAs and web developers, and I, I feel as though they're literally next to me. The only difference is that they're sitting in, yeah. I don't know, many thousands of kilometers away, difference just hooked up by internet connection, which is no, <laughs> exactly. The, the, the way I was explaining, let's say, if you're in a company that has is in a building with multiple floors or maybe multiple locations, then you might have people working for you that you don't see every day, mm. um, and you only see them very rarely. And you you might probably communicate with them through email, uh, Skype, chat, video conferencing, etc., etc. So it's basically the same thing, and, and the geographic distance doesn't really make it much um, it is not much of a factor anymore. That's right. Um, <laughs> Say our our clients here, they communicate with the, with their people here in the Philippines in exactly the same way they would do it with people that are in their own office. Yeah, it, it's really the, the communication level, of communication and barriers have completely been broken down. Because even now, I, I was actually just contacting an internet service provider just this morning before I got onto the call with you, just to chase yeah. up on something I had to do with my internet. Because since my hard drive crashed, I had to download all my information from the internet yeah. and it kind of chewed up my bandwidth. And when I caught up, it was definitely somebody from the Philippines because you could hear that with the accent. But their, their level yeah. of English is very much the same as me. I was talking to them as though they were literally next to me and they helped me in so such a quick and fast way. There's yeah. no, almost no difference. You know, it, it, it's, it's amazing how it's possible. So with VoIP and internet and everything, the barriers are completely broken down. No, exactly. I, I would almost say to say they're they're always talking about jobs that are tradable. So to say jobs that can actually be moved overseas without having a direct impact on how the work is done. And I think you'll be seeing that in the future, and it's happening now already. That almost every job becomes tradable. Um, it's going to be to say almost every white collar job. Let's put it that way. Is going to be something that's going to be able to be done from a geographic distance. Um, and that's, of course, to say exactly what we're doing here. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's already happening in large companies, like mostly telco companies, we're seeing it. Even yeah. actually the banks, we're seeing it very, very strongly here in Australia. I'm probably pretty sure that's happening in the States as well. I mean, do you get many, tele, do you get many call center type of clients that get, get you to manage the whole call center as well? Yeah. Now, of course, we are not a call center per se. So, mm -hmm. say what, the kind of clients that we attract that want to do call center work is are those who actually want to keep it in house. Mm -hmm. So they they don't don't just want to say, well, here's the script and here are the, the numbers you have to call. Go ahead and call them. And th these are more more companies that have to make sure that the quality of the calls are really good. Um, that there are so many tight controls about who they're calling and how, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's more companies who would like to have their own in house call center than really just outsource it. Yeah. So, actually, in many ways, that might maybe an important uh, point to make. Microsourcing is very much actually an offshoring solutions provider. So it's we're enabling people to do work offshore. Uh, it, it's not so much outsourcing because in many ways you're still keeping many of the things you're doing in house mm. uh, under your own control. Like I said, let's say offshore staff, for instance, means that these are still your employees, and you're basically telling them how to operate. You're not just telling us. Well, I would like to create uh, ten brochures. Please create them for me. Yeah. So that, that's a very diff different. That's a very important distinction between outsourcing and offshoring. Uh, and I think we operate pretty much more in the offshoring sequence while we're also still doing outsourcing. Yeah. So it's, a, lot, a little bit of middle middle ground, I guess. Middle ground. I, I totally agree, actually, on this one because I think the solution that you provide as an offshoring solution can really benefit a lot of 
businesses out there because obviously a lot of business still want to have some kind of control. They need to actually. Exactly. If they yep. don't, you know, things can just go all over the place and they won't even get delivery for their clients and projects. So it is important to have that yep. control. But at the same time, you need to have staff like yourself or your team yep. there to be able to support them in order to make sure because no one's going to be able to look over their back except for, you, for your team or your business, for example. No, exactly. Exactly. So absolutely. All right. Well, I'm I'm curious now because I know that I've I know quite a number of outsourcing companies that are in the Philippines, and I'm quite good friends with a few of them as well. And I know um, you probably know as well most most of them that are in the uh, probably in that arena or in the industry of this because it's it's very yeah. very strong over in the Philippines. A lot of people are probably wondering and asking is what's did really the benefits or the major differences that makes your company microsourcing stand out from the rest of them why would they choose your company say a client came through to you yeah obviously this is your selling point <laughs> yeah of course of course uh, there, there, there are a number of things to say first of all of course like I said we attract clients who are not so interested in outsourcing but they're more interested in offshoring mm -hmm. so they want to keep a, a lot of control and insight and transparency uh, into their offshore operation. So that's already one big difference. Let's say a lot of companies outsource, meaning they'll say, "This is the work I want you to do. Please execute it uh, A to Z." I'm giving it completely out of control, out of out of my personal hands. Um, now, but if you then would compare us to the other companies that are doing fairly similar stuff, uh, there are a few big differences. Uh, one of them is, for instance, our pricing model, which is very honest. Let's say the way we price our our services is that we we price it on a fixed fee per employee per month basis. And there are a lot of companies that do the same, but they'll just say, well, graphic designer level one costs you X amount of dollars, level mm -hmm. two X amount of dollars. Uh, with us, it's transparent. Let's say our pricing is based on our client based manpower costs, and on top of that, we charge a services fee. So, for instance, if you're looking at the entry level data processor, you're going to be able to select a person and we'll tell you what their salary expectations are. And then, based on that, you can say, well, I'd like to hire the guy who's asking for. Uh, $300 or I'll hire the guy who's asking for $400. It's all transparent, so there's no incentive for us to hire cheap people and build them out uh, at higher rates. Sure. The only way we earn our money is on the services fee, so if you're paying the salary and benefits and, we're, and, and everything else is through the services fee, then it's a beautiful transparent structure. Yeah, that's actually really, really smart because the fact is you're both transparent, that's where you build the trust with the client. But at the yep. same time, you are still you're not undercutting your staff or your employees because at the same time they're going to get paid for what they expect, and obviously with the benefits and so forth. I'm I'm curious Excellent. as well. Like, say for example, we're talking about graphic de designers here. Say you hire them for this is just a ballpark figure. I'm not, you know, it's not set in stone or anything. But say you've hired them for four hundred dollars per month. Yep. How much on top of that extra would you need to pay for, say, benefits, servicing fees, and all the other things that, that probably go with it? And also, like, the 13th month as well, you know, that, that's also yep. going to be something that's going to be included, too. Now, say, so if you look at the manpower costs, of course, you have the base salary, you've got the benefits, insurance policies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's actually not that big. The, the 13th month you mentioned, uh, that's actually the biggest component, because by Philippine Labor Code, all employees are entitled to a 13th month salary. Mm. December. But let's say if someone's base salary is missing, missing maybe 15,000 pesos, if you would then add all the benefits, including 13 months and insurance and everything else, uh, the direct manpower cost might reach about 18 or 19,000. That's not very much, actually. Now you can No, it's not a lot. <laughs> I mean, the, the no, extra exactly. 3,000 uh, pesos is equivalent yeah. to roughly about $70. So exactly. It's exactly. actually not very much. So, I mean, I mean no. to, to put it in perspective for people, yeah. Exactly. To give you an idea, let's say an entry-level employee might enter the job market expecting a salary of about 14,000 pesos. If you then look at the all-inclusive manpower cost to the employer, it's probably around 18 or so. So if you put that in, in dollar terms, that's probably around $400, something like that. And then, and then if you look at the services fee, the services fee depends a little bit, of course, on what you need. Let's say what kind of workstation do you need, what kind of software do you need installed on this workstation. Um, are you going to be operating in multiple shifts, for instance? That's another big thing. Ah. Uh, but to give you an idea, let's say if you're looking at uh, a project where you're operating in multiple shifts, so you've got people working day, daytime and nighttime, and they're sharing the same workstation, the services fee might be as low as $400, for instance, for the basic package. 
Yeah. Uh, if you're looking at the, that person in a single shift, it might be about 525, 550. So the all-inclusive cost of having an entry-level employee would be about $400 for direct service, for direct manpower cost, plus maybe $500 for the for the services fee. So it's about $900 plus, something like that. That's then you'll have your own dedicated employee. Uh, you selected him. Uh, he's operating from the Philippines in fantastic offices. He's well supervised. He's well taken care of. Uh, and like I said, because the salary and benefits are all transparent, it's something you can just openly discuss with your with your officer or staff. So. If they did really well, you want to give them an increase. It's something you can discuss. If you want to give them a bonus, it's something you can discuss. If you want to make part of their salary um, performance-based, for instance, that's also something you can openly discuss with them and, of course, with our HR department. That is, that, that is so, so... What's the word for I'm trying to find the words. It, it's so beneficial for anyone who's starting yeah. out because the fact is, is that I've, I've heard of stories, I've been through stories where people just have lost so much time and, and money as well by not having the right employee. And with the support and the system with backing you up, yeah. obviously it makes a huge, huge difference to be able to find the right person to work for you. Especially in a yeah. situation where they can come into an office, they've got supervisors, they've got people there to be able to... Uh, actually, I'm, I'm curious as well, do, do they get to meet other employees from other companies in the office or are they solely just in that office in their own space? Now, I've got to say our work floors, let's say most of them are shared, so you, you'd have multiple clients of ours sitting in, this, in the same area. Oh, okay. So is, that, is that what you meant? Is that what you're... Yeah, so therefore they're able yeah. to, to meet other, potentially other assistants or other staff there to be able to, I guess, have that yeah. kind of yeah. environment. Because it's, it's quite lonely out there to work by yourself at home, so coming to... No, no, exactly, no. Yeah, but that's actually, that's one of the wonderful things about the Filipino people. They're, they're so warm and friendly and they, they make friends so easily. Exactly. Because yeah, you're right, let's say some of our accounts are very small. Let's say you might have a client who only has one or two people working for, for him or her. So then, of course, they might get very lonely on the work floor if they're just sitting there all by themselves or with, with twos. But for some reason, they, they, they mingle really quickly and they become friends very, very... Uh, very easily. <laughs> that's a good thing yep. then. It's a, that's actually a big plus because it, it helps with uh, the satisfaction of working in an environment yep. that, that's really good for them. Now in general, say, if you look at the industry, it's really plagued by very high attrition. Let's say mm. the BPO industry is known for 30-40% uh, attrition rates uh, annually. Uh, our company has been able to keep it down to about 4% per year, wow. which is just incredible. It's like one tenth of the industry standard. And there are a number of reasons for that. Let's say one of the things is, of course, that we are we're not so much a call center, so that's where you'll find the highest attrition. Mm. Because of course, you're taking people off the streets, uh, people who might be highly educated or have all these dreams, and you're converting them into call center agents. So naturally, job satisfaction there might not be uh, not be the highest. So the reasons for our, our, our low attrition are that we mostly hire people who are actually doing what they were trained for, and, and they feel passionate about their field. Uh, B, of course, when they come in here, it's them telling them, telling us how they want to price themselves in the market. So they're saying, well, I'm a graphic designer, I've got three years of experience, so I think I'm, I should be worth X. So very much they're, they're in control of their own destiny by saying, well, I'm going to put myself in your database of candidates and I'm going to do that this pricing. Um, and then beyond that, uh, we just try to keep a very friendly, family-oriented environment here, which is very important because the Filipinos are so family-oriented and they need that kind of warm, friendly feeling uh, towards it to be really happy. So yeah, I felt that way, especially working with my staff. They just they're just so nurtured that they they stick with you yeah. by thick and thin, actually. So they're very very yeah. honest. They're very strong in integrity, and they're very family oriented. I totally totally agree with that one. No, exactly. So so the, and we always love this. Uh, the clients we love the most are the ones that come here with the right uh, the right mindset. So the mindset is. I want to hire people people in the Philippines, but I want them to be, to feel like they're part of my company. Yeah. So they very much involve them into their day to day. They involve them in company events, uh, big announcements. They keep them up to the up, up to up to date on what's happening in the company. Uh, they come over, they visit, they take them out for a drink, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that always works really well, and then you'll really see that the loyalty goes both ways. Um, yeah. And, and then you might, and then you can really say that that yeah, that person is really part of my company here. Uh, he works thousands of miles away, but he's really part of my company and I treat him as if he's my colleague. Yeah, it's it's so true. Like when you when they take ownership of what they do and they love what they do, the performance obviously skyrockets and they, they help the company exactly. grow even more. So it, it works yeah. both ways as you said. 
I know I mentioned and I asked you at the beginning, say for example, I was coming to approach your company and hire or look for someone. I didn't really get to ask you a little bit more in detail of the process. Say for example, I'm from, from Australia, just say it's me, yep. and I yep. contacted you, Philip, or contacted you through your website. What would be the next step? Like, How does the process work? Do I send an email off to you to say this is what I'm looking for? Or do you contact me? What, what happens? Um, now we'll probably want to get you on the phone, of course. That's probably the easiest thing to, to understand your company, understand yeah. the kind of requirements you have. And of course, just to spar on these ideas and say, what are the opportunities within your company to work with offshore staff or to outsource part of your processes? Um, so the moment we have that idea figured out, then of course, we have to get into the details. So what exactly are your manpower requirements? Um, what kind of job descriptions do you have, et cetera, et cetera? And we'll draft those together. Uh, of course, on the IT side, we have to look at what kind of workstations do you need, what kind of workflow systems, mm -hmm. um, and how are we going to get work from your office to our office and back again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, we look at what we call the operational framework. So how are we going to manage your day-to-day -day operation here in the Philippines? Um, what, what are your metrics? What are your KPIs? Uh, how should we report on them? Uh, are we going to meet with you weekly? Are we going to meet with you monthly? Uh, who do we meet with, et cetera, et cetera. Does this kind of operational framework so that we know exactly how to manage your offshore team. Um, now, once we have those three units identified, then, of course, we can start the actual setup process. Um, from the manpower side, which normally takes the longest, like I said, it means we're actually going to go out there and try to find people who are suitable candidates mm. for the job openings you have. Um, we'll present them to you, we'll send you their resume and their salary expectations, and then you can screen them in any way you want after we've already went through our our basic set of, uh, of screening tests. Actually, that was the next question I was going to ask you is where and how do you find people? Like, obviously, there's, there's thousands of people out there. Do you approach universities? Do you put ads up? What, how, how does your process of work and go and find people? I know it might be I, secret never, as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I, actually, we do it all. So if you look at our company, of course, we depend on our sales on finding the right people. Mm. So, so finding the right talent is pretty much our bread and butter. So. We've invested he very heavily in our recruitment organization. Uh, we have about 20 people uh, working in the recruitment department, and that's basically what they do. They just they're divided in their own specialty. So let's say we will have one recruiter who specializes on web designers, one who specializes on on data processors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So they all maintain their own pool of candidates. And when it comes to attracting people, it's everything you can imagine. It's through all the online job boards. It's through newspaper uh, ads. Uh, it's through partnerships with schools and training institutes. It's through referral programs. Um, and actually, referral programs are one of our strongest sources, to be honest, because, of course, uh, people who operate in a certain industry will have all their ex-colleagues and all their oh, schoolmates yes. uh, who they can tap into. So we have a very strong referral program where people can easily earn a lot of money just by, by referring their friends to come work at microsourcing. That's a really smart so, way to do it. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and actually, we even have our own website for that. It's called microrefer.com. It's just all about the referral program for people who want to suggest people to work for us. Fantastic. And, and the referral program is actually open to anyone. It doesn't even have to be our employees. It's open to employees, uh, candidates, uh, third-party headhunters. Anyone who wants to refer on behalf of Microsoft can do so. So, so to get back to your original question, let's say, how do we find our people? It's every imaginable channel of finding people, uh, job fairs, anything you can imagine to, to find the right talent, we do it. Which means that your scope is, very, or your net of, of capture is very, very large and therefore you can find the best pool of candidates to be able yep. to give you the best skill set so that you can provide for your client. Which is awesome because exactly. that's, that's what most clients are looking for, you know, it's not the easiest to find. If they spent hours doing this yep. themselves, I can imagine that amount of hours that they spent could have been recouped back just by hiring it through a company like yours. Yeah. And actually, one, one thing that's actually very valuable to note there is that it's completely risk-free from our client side. We don't expect them to pay or sign for anything until we present them with people who they think, well, those are the guys I can actually work with. So in theory, it could be that we're doing it for a month or so, just trying to find the right people, going through the screening processes, uh, setting up the IT systems, doing everything. And we're already doing all of those kind of things without having anything on paper or ever having received a dime from the client. So. From the client side, it's completely risk-free. You can give it a try, you can tell us the kind of people you're looking for, and until we present you with people you think would be a good suit, uh, there are no commitments, nothing. 
which in their sense it's really good because it's risk free but I, I obviously would be asking the question how do you afford to do that too because once if you get tons of those clients who ask you Philip can you just find me this and then in the end just don't go through with yep. it it happens. It happens to be honest, but that's just the risk we're willing to take because we don't want to uh, lock in people without having been being able to deliver. So we just go a long way in sharing the risk with our clients. Uh, so one of the ways we share the risk is by saying you don't pay or sign anything until we find you the right people. The other one is that if it doesn't work out, you can always terminate upon 30-day notice, no questions asked. So. Even if we went through all the trouble of establishing a large team for you and you all of a sudden say, well, my business took a hit or I'm going to downsize this or people are not performing, upon 30 day notice the whole thing goes away. So that's another big benefit as compared to actually coming to the Philippines and establishing your own company, mm. which would of course entail so many investments, due diligence and of course a lot of legal risk and of course long term risk because you're not going to be able to just walk away from here anymore. Yeah, definitely. So basically that's sort of like your 30 day money back guarantee, no risk for the clients. So if I was to come in and yep. after 30 days the, the people that were working for me just didn't work out and I said, hey Philip, I, you know, I don't, these people aren't suitable, would you go out and find yep. new people replacements or would you just, uh, the contract would just end there and that's it? It's, it's up to the client to be honest, to say if you still want to find replacements then we will go out and find replacements for you. If you really feel that this does, didn't work or, or maybe other reasons, let's say not, not performance wise but maybe mm -hmm. just your business can no longer afford to have offshore staff for instance, um, then, then you can also just shut it down. Mm. Well that's really, so really good. Sense, but, but I think that that's a good point, say it really goes to show how comfortable we are that we are going to be able to find the right people and to make sure that they perform well. Because uh, from our side, if we find the wrong people and they do not perform, uh, we will be running at a loss for sure. Yes. Uh, just because it took us so much time to actually set up the people, find them, etc., etc. Exactly, and it, it all comes back down to once you show to a client that you can deliver and they do have good yeah. performance in the return, it comes back down to you at the end of the day because it's more for long term, more than just a short term one off. So exactly. Just a question of, as well too is. As I said, uh, I come to you, I find, I go, Philip, please help me find a person like a graphic designer. I want to be able to get him started straight away. This is my salary expectations. How long would you expect to get a person set up in your office and up and running and following through all the way through to the operations and getting them started on the first yeah. day? How long does that usually take? I think on average between two to three weeks. Uh, it can be a lot faster. Uh, like I said, let's say the, the biggest hurdle is probably the manpower part. Mm -hmm. So finding the right people, and then even if you found them, how quickly are they going to be available to actually start working for you? Yeah. Because of course, in many cases, they might already be employed. They might have to serve uh, two weeks or three or four weeks uh, notice period. So those are mostly the things that delay us. Um, but I think an average between two to three weeks. That's pretty quick anyway. Because I was going to say, even in Australia, when we compare it. And if we went out and found another person or that person is ready to work for us, it takes them four weeks. They have to give the employer four weeks notice. Yeah. Plus also that one extra week or two weeks that they've been searching for employment as well. So in actual fact, it would take about six months, uh, six weeks to be able to get it, which is almost yeah, two months yeah, for us. Yeah. So comparison, yeah. that's pretty fast. No, but like I said, it's about an average. Yeah? Let's say we have many people who are available immediately. So let's say, mm -hmm. and plus you, one thing you have to realize about our recruitment, it's ongoing and it's proactively. So. We are constantly looking for graphic designers in the anticipation that we're going to be needing them in the future. So we always keep a pool of people who are readily endorsable, that's how we call that. So let's say people who we know are available uh, and then when a client comes in and says, well, I'm looking for a graphic designer, then we can say, well, here are five graphic designers, they're all available by next Monday. Um, so in that way, we can keep it very, very, very fast. Uh, so the quickest we've ever done is maybe a few days, the longest maybe five, six weeks average probably two to three weeks. That's pretty fast, yeah, I totally agree with yeah. that one. All right, well, I'm just curious as well too, is Philip, what are the plans for microsourcing, say in the next, say, 12 to 18 months? Is it, are you planning to, to do any special expansion or are you, are you happy to, to go through what you guys are currently doing right now? Now, let's say, you know our growth has been tremendous. Let's say if we grow any faster, I think we might, uh, might get into trouble, to be honest. <laughs> So, so the, the, the formula works really well. Let's say this concept of enabling foreign companies to operate hassle-free in the Philippines with us taking a lot of risks, that sells quite easily. So we're growing very fast thanks to that. Um, so we're not going to change the model or the way we do business. Uh, the things we will do, for instance, of course, open more offices. 
so by the end of this year, we're probably going to open up an office in Cebu. Um, Very good. Just just to create more geographic divide and to just say from a risk mitigation perspective, if something happens in Manila, then at least we can still operate from Cebu, for instance. Uh, so so th those are some of the plans we have. And beyond that, it's basically all about just keeping up with growth and making sure that we can keep all our quality parameters uh, while we're going through all that growth. That's great. And I know that uh, yeah, both Tanya from your team and, and Nomna and yourself have just been talking as well recently with me about doing some special promotion as well or special contest that we're going to be running as well shortly. So I thought I mentioned that to the listeners yeah. and, and viewers. And if you are interested in finding out a little bit more about that, we're going to be making a special announcement on the 20th of June uh, for, for this thing. So Philips is going to be contributing quite a, a great, um, a strong presence here. And he's going to be able to support some person out there through this lucky contest for something. So we'll announce it on the 20th. And I thought I'd just mention this as well. So stay tuned for that. Now, yep. I just want to say thank you so much, Philip. It's been a real pleasure to interview you today and to find out a lot more about microsourcing and also a little bit more about yourself and how outsourcing works in the Philippines or offshoring works in there. How can people yep. find out more about your company as well? Um, now the, the best tool is really the website. Let's say www.microsourcing.com. It has all the information about our delivery models, the disciplines we specialize in, the management team, uh, our facilities, etc., etc. Um, one thing that's really nice is the virtual tour, to be honest. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a look at our at our people, at our offices, etc., etc., the virtual tour will really show you that in great detail. And it's a, it's a very open and transparent look into the way we do business. So I definitely recommend having a look at that one. Hey, that's excellent. Well, I personally have already met your staff already, so I'm, I'm yeah. very... And I haven't even come over. I can see them by the camera. So <laughs> it's been excellent to the... And I, I can tell you that he's, Philip's a really transparent person, and... He's a great guy to work with and for anyone out there, check out microsourcing.com. There's a lot of great information and also a lot of great things that they do for people out there and lots of businesses. So thank you again, Philip. It's been a pleasure to have you on today and we'll definitely be speaking Thanks, soon. It's time for the Outsourcing Live Quick Tip. Inside the quick tip today, I'm going to be recommending a project management system that I use with my virtual team and also basically run everything in my business. This virtual software, as you can say, or project management system is an online software called Basecamp. If you haven't heard of Basecamp, you can go to basecamphq.com and once you go there, you can set up a free account. They've got numerous different accounts that allow you to have multiple projects, but what you can do is set up a free account just to trial it out. What I've done with this system is I've used it with my virtual team to be able to create and manage a lot of automated systems. It's fast, it's easy, and also it's simple to use. And that's the beauty about this. I've tried so many different project management softwares out there, and so far, I've come back down to Pacecamp because it's just easy and simple to use. I'm emphasizing this quite a bit, and our productivity has increased so much because of this. So if you want to actually check it out, all you have to do is just basically go to Basecamp HQ, sign up for a free account, and I'll show you how to do that if you go to my tutorial as well. And basically inside the tutorial, I'll be showing you how you can use this whole system the way that I use it as well. Now, if you want to also see what my tutorial is, just simply go to my website at outsourcinglive.com and there'll be a video that demonstrates the step-by-step -step on how to be able to set up the Basecamp HQ system and track everything for free like how I've done it at outsourcinglive.com forward slash Basecamp HQ dash tutorial. And inside that tutorial, you'll see how I go through and set it up and how I use the whole system to manage my whole team, my virtual staff. All right, so that's the Basecamp HQ system, an excellent piece of project management software that I recommend and I use every day. And I highly recommend you check it out as well. Now, if you like more resources like this one, you can find them inside Mass Outsource Mastermind, along with video tutorials and step-by-step -step instructions showing exactly how I use them. To get a 30-day no-risk trial membership to Mass Outsource Mastermind, simply visit freevideoset.com. Until next time, I wish you success in your quest for outsourcing.